Good afternoon dear friends. Welcome to Photon TNA Daily News Analysis. Let us briefly see what are the major news items of today that is 20th August 2019. Before moving on, let me briefly introduce our courses. We offer courses for prelims combines, optional subjects, Kerala Administrative Service Examinations, Long Term Civil Service, Foundation courses for school going students from classes 6 to 12 and college going students as well. We have got branches in Kollam, Vakkanadu and Kotaragara. Now let us see what are the major news items. Yesterday we have seen some of the recommendations of Bimal Jalan panel. Actually this has been formed for reviewing of the Reserve Bank of India's economic capital framework. Based on their recommendations, RBI has transferred a whopping amount of 1.76 lakh crores to the central government. In this context, it is of relevance to see what are the major recommendations of the Bimal Jalan panel. It was set up by the RBI to review the RBI's economic capital framework. He has suggested lots of recommendations all of which has been accepted by the RBA. Let, let us see what are the major recommendations. It has suggested that the framework, that means the economic capital framework may be periodically reviewed after every five years. So that if there is any problems with the uh, distribution of surplus amount to the central government, it can be reviewed in every five years. This is what the major recommendation is. The panel also recommended to align the central bank's accounting year with the financial year which could reduce the need for paying interim dividend. At present, the central bank's accounting year starts from July till June. So July to June is the present accounting year and the financial year as we all know that it is from April to March. So the panel has recommended to align these two that is the accounting year to that of the financial year. The panel is of the view that it could reduce the need for interim dividends being paid by the RBA. The payment of interim dividends may then be restricted to extraordinary circumstances. If this is done, the RBA does not need to pay the interim dividends. That amount which has been used for paying interim dividend could be used for extraordinary circumstances. The committee also recommended that the RBA should put in place a framework for assessing the market risk of its off-balance sheet exposures in view of their increasing significance. Therefore, they have suggested to put in a framework for assessing the market risk. Then as we have seen yesterday, the panel also suggested there should be a clear distinction between the two components of economic capital that is the realized equity and revaluation balances. We have seen in the yesterday's lecture what are these. and. Now the panel has suggested the RBA to keep a clearer distinction between the two. This is done mainly because of the volatile nature of revaluation balances. The committee observed that even if the RBA's economic capital could appear to be relatively higher, it is largely on account of the revaluation balances. We know that these are determined by exogenous factors such as market prices and the central bank's discharge of its public policy objectives. Therefore, the committee said that even if RBA's economic capital is a uh, little higher, it is largely on account of the revaluation balances. So, the panel suggested that there should be a clear distinction between the two components. And as far as the surplus distribution policy for the future is concerned, the panel recommended that the RBA should move away, move away from targeting total economic capital alone to one where it has a dual set of targets that is the total economic capital of the RBA and the level at which the realized equity to be maintained. So at present the RBA carries the surplus distribution policies based on targeting the total economic capital alone. The panel has suggested that it, uh, there should be a dual set of targets that is one is the total economic capital of the RBA and also the level at which the realized equity is to be maintained. The committee recommends that the minimum level of realized equity to be maintained should be the sum of the monetary and financial stability risk, credit risk and operational risk. The RBA should calculate the sum of the 
monetary and financial stability risk, credit risk and the operational risk to arrive at the minimum level of realized equity. And along with that, the total economic capital also should be calculated to distribute the surplus. So these are some of the major recommendations of the Bimal Jalan Panel Committee. Now moving on, the next article is about promoting for cleaner fuels. Why cleaner fuel is required? Because it is essential for reducing rural air pollution and improved health. We all know that in most of the rural areas, they are using the wood as a cooking fuel rather than gas. And they have a stigma that is regarding that the food cooked out of the wood is more tastier and healthier than the uh, gas. Therefore, in this context, there is a need for awareness creation among the rural community regarding the cleaner fuels. <coughs> there needs to be communication regarding the harms of solid fuels and the benefits of clean fuels. And also, at the same time, there is also a need for reducing the cost of LPG cylinder refills in rural areas. We know that the cost of LPG cylinder is so high that the it is it has become unaffordable for the rural areas. Therefore, it is being suggested that there needs to be a reduce in cost of LPG cylinder refills. And also there needs to promote gender equality within the households, particularly in cooking and related tasks. Presently, the cooking is considered as a realm of the women. And it is being regarded that women has the responsibility of cooking and other related affairs. Therefore, there needs to be a promotion of gender equality that is what the article is suggesting now moving on the need for development banks we have seen in some of the last lectures finance minister has proposed setting up of a new development bank in this context we can see what are development banks. development banks are financial institutions that provide long time credit for capital intensive investments spread over a longer period and yielding lower rates of returns such as urban infrastructure, mining and heavy industry and irrigation systems. Such banks often lend at low and stable rates of interest to promote long term investments with considerable social benefits. These banks are known as term lending institutions or development finance institutions. To lend for long term, development banks require corresponding long term sources of finance. These are usually obtained by issuing long dated securities in capital market subscribed by long term savings institutions such as the pension and life insurance funds and post office deposits. And there is also a social benefits attached to it. Considering the social benefits of such investments and uncertainties associated with them, development banks are often supported by the government and international institutions. Such support can be in the form of tax incentives and administrative mandates for private sector banks and financial institutions to invest in securities issued by the development banks. Now let us see the history of development banks in India. IFCI, previously the Industrial Financial Corporation of India was set up in 1949. This was probably India's first development bank for financing industrial investments. Then in 1955, the World Bank prompted the Industrial Credit and Investment Corporation of India, that is the ICICA, which is a parent organization of the present largest private commercial bank of India, that is the ICIC Bank. The World Bank prom prompted a collaborative effort between the government with majority equity holding and India's lending industrialist with nominal equity ownership to finance modern and relatively large private corporate enterprises and in 1964 IDBI was set up as the apex body for all development financial institutions. Now where does these institutions get funding? As the domestic saving rates was low and capital market was absent during those times, development finance institutions were mainly financed by the lines of credit from Reserve Bank of India that is some of its profits were channeled as long term credit and also the statutory liquidity ratio bonds into which the commercial banks had to invest a proportion of their deposits. So basically they were funded by the credits from Reserve Bank of India and also the statutory liquidity ratio bonds. However, the major problem was that of 
high NPS allegedly caused by the politically motivated lending and inadequate professionalism in assessing the investment projects for economic, technical and financial viability. Therefore, these institutions were disbanded in 1991. After 1991, following the Narasimha Committee reports for on financial sector reforms, development financial institutions were disbanded and got converted to commercial banks. However, the result of such a move was a steep fall in long-term credit from a tenure of 10 to 15 years to 5 years. Let us see what are the development banks in other countries. In China, the Agricultural Development Bank of China, China Development Bank and the Export Import Bank of looks after the long-term financing requirements. These have been at the for forefront of financing its industrial developments. After the global financial crisis, these institutions have undertaken China's risky technological investments, helping it gain global dominance in IT hardware and software companies. And also in Germany, Germany's development bank, known as the KFW, has been spearheading long-term investments in green technologies and for sustainable development efforts requiring long-term capital. So, it is being said that a development finance institution, as it is lacking in India, is a need of the hour and the move of the government is a much needed one. That is what the article is suggesting. The next is about Child Wellbeing Index. This index was launched by NGO World Vision India and Research Institute IFMR LEAD. This index has topped Kerala in the chart and also listed Madhya Pradesh as the worst performing state. Another finding is that among UTs, Puducherry was the best performing with good scores in healthcare and nutrition. In this context, let us see what is the Child Welfare Index talking about. It is basically built on three dimensions. What are these three dimensions? One is the healthy individual development, then positive discrimination and protective context. So this index is basically built on these three dimensions. Focusing on these three key dimensions, 24 indicators were selected to develop the computation of child well-being index. The report highlights the multi-dimensional approach towards measuring child well-being, which is going beyond mere income poverty. In this report, it calls for states to look at their respective scores on the dimensions of child well-being and to prepare for priority areas of in intervention with specific plans of action. So this report is of great significance so that it can be used as an index by the state governments for their development in various sectors. Another news is a rare species of spider has been spotted in Tamil Nadu away from their native place. This species is known as peacock parachute spider or guti tarantula which has been classified as critically endangered by the IUCN. It is basically found in the eastern guts. However, it has recently been spotted in Villupuram district of Tamil Nadu. So this is a rare incident. This is a rare incident that it has been spotted in a place away from the eastern guts which is its native place. So these are the major news items of today. We will come up with more news items of tomorrow. Thank you and have a nice day.